Hello and a very good evening from uh, Kolkata where dusk has descended as my backdrop. And uh, good morning to all those who are just uh, waking up of, or have awakened from a nice sleep. And a good afternoon to all others in different other time zones. I am Nilanjan Ghosh and I take this opportunity to welcome you to the winter retreat of uh, tellmeyourstory.bees as we discuss on something quite interesting and uh, close to my heart. Uh, winter in global literature. And with me are three distinguished panelists, Nabila Jamshid, who happens to be a public policy and development professional, uh, Joy Shengupto, uh, an esteemed and a very cherished actor, and Professor Tom Lutz, chair and uh, distinguished professor of creative writing, University of California at Riverside, an author and a literary critic. As such, human moods, emotions, and sentiments have been affected by nature through its varied hues of uh, changing seasons. This has largely been reflected in literature, drama, dance, and music. Now in the part of the world where I presently stay, that is the Ganges uh, Delta, the impacts of the northerly winds of winter on human moods were aptly captured by Rabindranath Tagore in his verses, Shiter Porosh Theke Theke Jai Bujhi Oi Deke Deke Translated in English, this implies the icy touch now and then gives a call as it were. When will it be my time to give up all that I call mine? Whether as the backdrop of a harrowing tale or the theme of a melancholy poem, winter has long inspired authors, poets and literary figures around the world. Yet for me, Winter served as a season of fun, frolic, holidays, picnic, the game of cricket, and many a freedom. And possibly there lies the clear divergence, the clear difference between the moods created in the Occident and the Orient or South Asia. Now, I, I recall the Halloween uh, Millennium Trilogy of Stieg Larsson, uh, the girl with the dragon tattoo, the girl who played with fire, and the girl who kicked the hornet's nest, the three novels which was set in the backdrop of winter. And I have also seen the first novel, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, which was made into uh, an English Hollywood movie with D Daniel Craig in the lead role. I distinctly recall the snow-capped white fields added to the eeriness of the storyline. On the other hand, the very melancholy of winter has been captured by English poets and authors from time to time. Whether it is Charles Dickens, whose oft-quoted introductory paragraph in a tale of two cities that stands out as a literary marvel uh, where Dickens states, it was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness, it was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. Or it is Percy Shelley who in Ode to the West Wind states, if winter comes, can spring be far behind? So somehow it is always winter that has been the, in some way or the other, portrayed as villain of peace. Interestingly, I distinctly recall uh, watching the movie The Seventh Seal by Ingmar Bergman during my student days at the university. Now, much in contrast, the, the usual feeling that we have now how death is going to be portrayed. Death is dark. This is what uh, essentially we perceive. Now, death has been portrayed by Bergman as white as snow. And even in the movie, The Schindler's List, the red jacket worn by the kid in the white snowy background appeals to a very distinctive, uh, sensuous, eerie, eerie feelings. On the other hand, in fact, uh, Robert Frost portrays or rather symbolizes winter or identifies winter with tranquility, uh, especially in the poem Stopping by the Woods on a Snowy Evening. And in the poem, uh, Frost uses the wintry setting to embody the speaker's, or, 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 or suppose say, the protagonist's private moment of uh, peace and solitude. The snow and the dark creating a temporarily pure and isolated space to match his mental state. And it goes in this fashion. I'm just quoting from, him, uh, from the poem itself. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. And the last four lines, which happen to be a classic and not quoted, the woods are lovely, dark and deep, 
but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. On the other hand, Edmund Spencer, in his procession of the seasons, uh, identifies winter with old age, much in line with William Shakespeare's lyrical quotes. Youth like summer morn, age like winter weather, youth like summer brave, age like winter bear. The same mood goes with uh, Chilean poet Pablo Neruda's verses. Now, interestingly, Pablo Neruda doesn't belong to Western Europe, but uh, fr from uh, Latin America. But when he goes to Germany, his very emotions and sentiments get reflected in his poem, The Horses, in this fashion. I'm just quoting from it. From the window, I saw the horses. I was in Berlin in winter. The light had no light. The sky had no heaven. There was white like wet bread. And from my window, a vacant arena bitten by the teeth of winter. So whether it is any, for, uh, any form of creativity, any form of writing, any form of, uh, any, any form of literature, or any form of emotion, it gets affected by the changing seasons, whether it is with uh, Spanish poet Federico Garcia Lorca or Bengali poet Jivananda Dash, the fill of winter chill in various forms can be felt. Human expressions of its emotions happen in various forms. Literature, culture are only one of them. But with this prelude, I think it is time to hear from those who really matter today. So, uh, Nabila, Joy, and uh, has Tom joined? I just can't see Tom till now. I think she, he will be joining in a few minutes. You are requested to speak for 10 minutes each. In the, on the other hand, the viewers and the audience can type in their questions or comments. And after a round of deliberations, we can have a second round with the questions. But uh, at the outset, let me go to Nabila first, also because of her very interesting professional background as a public policy and development professional. Uh, a developmental dimension to, to this entire discourse will indeed be a very new way of looking at things. And this becomes even more critical and crucial as our very ambient nature, natural and the social ecological systems actually keep on shaping and framing our sentiments and emotions and often uh, get reflected in our literature, movies and ethos. So uh, Nabila, how would you like to look at this phenomenon? It's over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ghosh. Um, and I think you covered much of the aesthetic of winter and how valuable it is to literature in your opening comments. Um, as you very rightly said, um, I am a development professional. I work in, in the international geopolitical security sector. So for me, um, there is a very interesting lens at which I come to literature um, and, and the metaphor of winter. Um, and that is those words that we use to advance policy and, and, and the, the language that we used to talk about um, the winters of our discontent as speech writers. So one of the biggest roles that I've had throughout my professional career has been that of a speech writer, um, and which is just an exercise really in making metaphors an instrument of policy and in being able to articulate the challenges of our time and being able to do it in a way that's um, that, that not only describes the discourse, but also shapes it in the future. And, what I have observed in this field of work is is how much winter becomes, um, you know, sort of an instrument that allows us uh, to do that. So, so I I am in the business of the winters of our discontent, as as you know, Shakespeare had afforded Richard the Third the lines. Now is the winter winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by this son of York. And um, I think that is the most intuitive way of capturing what winter has meant to the way uh, that we conduct discourse, the way we we do literature, the way that it's shaped, the way history has been shaped both by the, the natural ecology of winter, but also by um, the, the, the metaphors and the language that we've used to engage it, to describe it. And um, I, I, I consider, so the, the reason that I'm bringing this lens to, to, to our conversation, which is very much a literary conversation, and this is a literature retreat, um, is because to me, I think speech writing and speeches are um, a neglected form of literature. And it's it's a bit it's a little ironic to say that because um, on the one hand, it's, you know, speech writing is not your 
canon of literary work, uh, and yet it is one of the most public forms of, uh, it's it's the most public, it's in the public space, rather than being between the covers of a book uh, that is then read in an interpersonal ba way by by the reader and, you know, in, in the solitude of their own thoughts. Um, a speech is very much the most uh, public of the way that we use words as a society. Um, and in this, you see, you know, the, the winters of our discontent, um, you know, to describe a particular political environment as being bleak or empty or stark or cold or uh, or a period of uh, which requires that the masses be stirred to resilience and endurance uh, you see that 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 analogy of winter being used a lot so you know joe biden uh, president elect used um the analogy of the dark winter that is ahead of us to describe the the covid challenge uh, that that still lies ahead the next few few months um i was a speech writer for the chemical weapons convention secretariat and we spoke a lot about the fog of war uh, you know because chemical substances as an instrument of war are defined by a fog, so, which is again, um, you know, sort of elements of winter. We hear about long nights, uh, new dawns, uh, you know, uh, ahead with the horizon, uh, the shadows and specters of such and such. We talk, we talk about the warmth of our shared humanity. Uh, you know, when uh, the fight against the, the, the winters of our struggles becomes, uh, you know, something that is to, must be dealt with through the warmth that we share with each other, through the kindness that we show. Uh, we talk about spring, of course, the most, uh, you know, the, the, the most uh, well-known example of this is the Arab Spring and uh, President Bill Clinton at the time, um, you know, in, in the year 2011, actually referred to the coming of uh, the Arab Spring as, uh, you know, the, the long Arab winter has come to thaw. Um, and uh, we talk about the winds of change, um, you know, Barack Obama has spoken of in this winter of our hardship. So winter is the element through which we constantly dramatize history. And I think that's been a very much a part of both the political discourse and it's very much been part of literature as well. And I think uh, a very interesting lens uh, when we talk about winter and global literature is to see how this force majeure, this uh, this thing that is outside of us, this very cyclical coming and going of seasons is not only shaped history in a way that's understudied, but also shaped the way that the history of literature um, has been written. Um, I think winter became such an interesting political metaphor for the way that political writing and political fiction and history is written. Also, because a lot of the the stuff that uh, occupies uh, the the makers of policy are are things of winter. So uh, you rightly mentioned, Dr. Ghosh, uh, ecological crisis, and oddly, you know, the end game of that is uh, is a warming planet. Um, but it is the long term ice age and the, the metaphors of you know the, the glaciers melting, the the bleakness, the absence of life. Um, those are the evocative things that we use to talk about climate change and global warming. Uh, you know, when it comes to wars, we've got the, the Cold War and the fog metaphors. Um, I've worked in the WMD sector and the nuclear winter is the evo evocative metaphor there. Uh, the fog of this pandemic, again, it's, this is, so this is the lens of winter for me. It's, it's the, it's a thin frost through which um, ages wait for spring. It's it's the endless trudge through which we, uh, you know, through which the passions of crowds are raised, the the resilience and the endurance of masses are to be, uh, you know, uh, to be riled up, uh, and then the coming of bleakness is to be warned against. Um, and I think the reason why winter becomes such an important and elegant metaphor uh, for the struggles of human life, it's, 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 it's because I think it suggests the presence of something that's unopposable. It's, it's, a, it's a, like I said, a force majeure event to use the very um, ugly corporate language to describe it. It almost sounds like something you'd put in a legal contract, but that's really what winter is. Um, it's cyclical. So there is a, a slight existential inevitability. So I think, um, so whether you read Camus' work where he says, you know, in the midst of winter, I found that there was within me an invincible summer. Um, I think it helps the existentialist cause in that sense, because um, the way that winter is cyclical, and you know that at the end of this winter, there will be a spring. Uh, the way that uh, winter is 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 something beyond our control. The way it ebbs and flows is kind of very true, also of the human condition, because writers are, I think, constantly struggling to find ways to describe those human condition e events that are inescapable, that are inevitable. There are certain sorrows and losses of human life that that must be dealt with. That that will that will occur to everybody, and and therefore, you know, the the the, the the, the the metaphor of winter to say that there is this is cyclical that this is inevitable is very useful in that sense um 
and also in the, in the business of my work uh, which is which is speech writing which is to to articulate policy in 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 evocative language uh, but also the business of you know um, uh, writers who are trying to be hopeful to demonstrate hope or to demonstrate that a new dawn is coming this is uh, i think winter is is a is a great device because it permits the shattering and breaking of a certain crisis um you know the reason that we use winter is because it's temporary it's that 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 is its character i mean john steinbeck uh, when he said what good is the warmth of summer without the cold of winter to give it sweetness in that sense lends even winter a bit of um you know it's it's been romanticized in in that sense and i think um again you know i i find it very fascinating to look at the history of global literature because the romanticization of winter really started when um you know there were parts of the world in which we found uh, implements to deal with it so you know only when winter became comfortable and you could shelter from it and you could be indoors and you had reached a certain level of development uh, you know where it was uh, it was you know you could warm yourself and there was a fire and there was you know your food was taken care of and there was no insecurity that's when um there was uh, that is when really we started romanticizing winter it became this aesthetic thing uh, that you could look out towards the uh, towards uh, you know through your window um this was also an interesting period of uh, it's also an interesting metaphor for renewal and it's not something that you see random speech writers or writers using in a way it's it's also become the way that we fashion politics so for me in that sense winter is this very interesting bridge between real life and and the words that we put on paper so for example uh, renewal in american politics when clinton was inaugurated in 93 he said today we celebrate the mystery of american renewal um this ceremony which is the inauguration of the president which you know is is um you know in january which is the coming towards the end of a long period of winter the ceremony is held in the depth of winter but by the words we speak and the faces we show the world we force the spring a spring reborn in the world's oldest democracy that brings forth the vision and the courage to reinvent america so that that those were clinton's words um at the inauguration using that metaphor very strongly um so for me winter is a political metaphor uh, it's the way that i read literature so for example german nationalism um you know adam gopnik has a very interesting book about uh he's a writer of the new yorker is a very interesting book on the way that winter has been an agent of um you know the way that it has shaped our cultures um and he talks about how german nationalism identified itself when it emerged um as opposed to the nationalism of other countries by virtue of the fact that germany had the kind of winter that france did not have and so therefore winter became an artifact in the way that literature was written and the way that you know culture was conducted in germany um you know uh, russia of course brought to us uh, winter in a big way that's the most the most formidable presence for me in global literature of winter is of course uh, in russian literature so you know when pushkin says um, i live alone and sadly wait to see when when death will come at last just so when the winds of winter moan and snow descends in frigid flakes upon a naked branch alone the final leaf of summer shakes there is again this almost like a, a a a reconciliation with the inevitability of both death and loss because winter is inevitable and because it will eventually break um you spoke about you know the scandinavian crime novel of course uses the oppressiveness of winter very effectively um it also provides you know this sort of dark of night uh atmospherics for espionage literature so john le car for example uh, steinbeck uh, in their intrigue used winter to great effect um it's also it, it's also you know provides a microcosm so when you have a set of character that's sheltered in from a snowstorm or you know a, a dark winter it also gives you the artifice of a stage so almost like a playwright might um you know look for instruments with which to bind characters so that they stay together um for a while you know on the stage or in a room and they couldn't be allowed to go anywhere is a service that is provided by winter say for example um in the murder on the orient express um you know the word orient is in the name but the novel is very much about winter um winter is a metaphor for strangeness again you know the tropics are not what uh, what is is not the lens with which we describe a new and strange planet uh, in in science fiction so emptiness darkness coldness these are all winter things um winter is of course um and then you know and this is i'll conclude with this but winter is also being used as an object of hope and this is where the whole global literature thing becomes very important to me because i think when we talk about winter as a device to suggest 
struggle or as as a centerpiece of characters you'll find that this is something that that's mostly where you know where winter is a character in people's daily lives so it has to be you know the the colder part of the world um and therefore the global north i think has dominated uh, the way that we read winter literature and the way that winter literature is written and the global south so much um doesn't have room for that aesthetic because um you know a majority of the global south lives in countries which are warm countries uh, we don't really have uh, you know uh, apart from a few parts of our country the kind of winter that would evoke you know a, a gulag literature or you know um the life of ivanovich in a gulag is not something that would come out of say you know the indo gangetic plains in india um but you know so that it also depends on even within the microcosm of a certain place so martin luther king again going back to the speech metaphor um you know when he was talking about the liberation of uh, of his people he said but there is something that i must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold which leads into the palace of justice in the process of gaining our rightful place we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds the sweltering summer of legitimate discontent will not pass until there is an invigorating autumn of freedom and equality so winter the coming of autumn the coming of coolness is also seen as a sign of hope because sometimes crisis is described more in the warm and hot metaphors um you know so of, for example hamlet when he's talking about his to be or not to be speech and contemplating suicide who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life again the grunting and the sweating of hot weather is also been you know indicated um as a crisis um winter has also been indifference so i spoke about albert camus earlier in his invincible summer within his heart uh, but also the philosophical calm of like uh, nausgard who's you know written about uh for example a quote of his which i which i really like snowing is the only thing i know and i do it really well why compare myself to summer this is the sort of existential calm that comes over you and i was uh, there's a very interesting piece about nausgard's work in fact um which which describes the context of this existential calm of the nordic literary cultures in the context of uh, you know how they, they have a winter and so um in nordic myth the end of the world or ragnarok uh which is also you know which translates roughly into twilight of the gods which is when the gods will go to war and the world will finally end comes about as a winter uh, you know the sun disappears and then the world sinks into the darkness and so this coming of winter as the end of the world i think also gives people an instrument again to you know create modern mythologies which are very consistent with that um and you know of course this is a good time to be reading uh, literature about winter because i think covid 19 that's affected all of us has really changed our relationship with winter it's not uh, we're not outside as much um, you know unless we are in front facing essential services of course uh, for a lot of us it's been more sheltered in and so we haven't experienced winter as as a real presence in our lives in that sense um, and i think that's why it's so important and so interesting to look at how winter as a natural artifact has shaped our literature uh, so much in the last many many centuries i'm going to end there and then i'd love to get into a discussion well that uh, it's a huge range that you have covered from the american elections to climate change to albert camus and existentialism and of course uh, i mean one of the very critical interventions that came from you is that uh, it, it is also a political metaphor for you uh I would like to come to none other than one of my most favorite actors in fact he also happens to be a favorite actor of my wife so uh, mr joy shengupto uh, uh rather, rather i often relate joy shengupto with uh, one particular movie which also has uh, the monsoon rather which was a very dominant force that was probably one of his bengali movies that i have seen one of the very few bengali movies that i have seen so far in my life and that was a classic brishti te jara bhije chilo right so from the monsoon how do you how do you look at a different season altogether that is winter how does it shape your mood how does it shape your emotions and does it really <clears throat> shape your acting as well at times it does uh, thank you dr gosh and thank you navila for that enthralling uh, analysis of winter vis-a-vis so many dimensions of life uh you know my father was a very big fan of uh, shelley and wordsworth so from the time i was born and that's what i would like to think every time there has been any issue at home he would constantly be muttering if winter is here can spring be far behind 
and this is something i grew up hearing um, from my father so it became part of my subconscious you know uh, he of course quotes shelly in order to dispel any insecurity or fear that could be uh, <clears throat> looming within us and he believes that uh, hope floats at the end of winter and that's how i grew up mm, the very first uh, piece of literature that was handed to me was uh, david copperfield by charles dickens and uh, like any dickensian novel set in a, in the victorian era winter or cold is uh, all encompassing the cold stones the cold people the colder uh, emotions the cold ethos the foggy grubby industrial london everything again loomed on me from age 5 and a half 6 <coughs> uh, the first indian literature that he kind of gave it to me was again based in a hill station which was called the manitas of kumayu by jim corbett again it was all about cold place winter mountain a character who is a hunter a prey etc 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 then i started reading uh, mupasa's short stories and again winter became a very very strong metaphor for sorrow for for desolation etc 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 so these were the moods which uh, governed my early uh, growing up and my relationship with literature per se even before i took to acting uh, completely so uh, in fact even in acting the first play i did was a was a, in lower case it was a nativity play so you know i was wrapped in a, what we call a kambal you know that sort of shawl playing jehova in a, in a wintry uh, sort of a day so uh, winter had had uh, this uh, strange relationship with me vis-a-vis -vis the 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 ethos and the values and the sensibilities of the western hemisphere to a large extent it was only when i grew up that i realized that it's an anomaly for us because uh, we who live in the warm uh, humid countries especially us who have grown up in places like calcutta or chennai or even mumbai in sultry conditions winter actually presents joy for us it actually presents uh, an imagery of comfort of of the security blanket literally you know as opposed to what the the ideas and the imagery which comes from the western hemisphere where where winter is always representation of uh, at its uh, least one can say uh, discomfort and 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 biding time for hope to float and at its worst downright depression and isolation <coughs> over here just the opposite i mean we waited for winter to arrive which was far too short in certain areas of india we waited for our winter holidays so so that we could go to the northern part of india to the hills and the hill stations and and get into our 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 warm clothes and sweaters and go outdoors and play so in a sharp contrast to the west where outdoors means summer over here in india outdoors to a large extent represent represented winter and not summer so this contrast this contrast in sensibility kind of emerged for me at a latter period and then i started realizing that why uh, overwhelming uh, amount of uh, what should i say creative work whether it's literature whether it's painting uh, even music uh, is placed in spaces and areas which were cold and stark and therefore starkness became part of the imagery uh, and therefore uh, anything which had to do with certain kind of negativity was somehow uh, uh, metaphorically symbolized with 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 winter or cold uh, like shakespeare did shakespeare uh, apparently grew up in a village which was uh, surrounded by mud and snow and ice and and uh, blistering icy wind for for months and months and months and that kind of shaped his understanding and imagery of winter he uses weather uh, constantly in his plays uh, nature and weather and winter always always almost always comes negatively whenever he's talking about 
rage or fury or anger, he's talking about winter. When he was talking about coldness of heart, he's talking about winter. You know, the only time I think uh, uh, he talks about winter in a slightly, I won't say positive, but uh, slightly redeeming way where I think was in, as you like it, where he says, blow, blow, thou winter wind, thou are not so unkind as man's ingratitude. So man's ingratitude is colder than uh, winter. That's the only time. Otherwise, winter is always negative in, 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 in Shakespearean uh, imagery, you know. But in sharp contrast to that, in the Indian uh, um, imagery of literature and everything, winter doesn't present such a stark picture. And that uh, kind of struck me. Most of our work I have seen are, uh, are reflective of our oppressive summer, rather not, not the oppressive winter. So the oppressive summer, even the imagery of a character wiping sweat from his brow is the overwhelming imagery of, of, of Indian uh, uh, literature, Indian imagination, Indian creativity uh, all the time. It's not so much of the winter. Yes, there are there are imageries in cinema and, and plays of winter where you sh where you show a homeless man shivering in the streets and dying of cold. That is very much there. But as much as it is of a summer drought, uh, bringing hordes and hordes of people uh, in, in, in cross migration and, 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 and penury. So, so both are there. So winter is, is used negatively only seldomly in Indian literature, in Indian plays or Indian cinema. In fact, in Indian cinema, we have seen a irreverent celebration of winter in the, in the, in the films of the 60s and 70s, where uh, all the Shami Kapoor films, for example, uh, the hero wooed the heroine in Shimla or in Kashmir, in, in, in snow, where the, where the hero is, is uh, uh, completely uh, fitted with wonderful jackets and, 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 and coats and stuff like that, whereas the heroine is in a, in a sleeveless blouse and a thin chiffon rolling in the snow, and they're singing to, 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 to glory. So, so winter here, in a way, represented Chahe Koi Mujhe Jangli Kahe. It's, it's, a, it's a Yahoo moment. Winter is a Yahoo moment for the, for the Indian um, imagination. Uh, because that's where they would go to woo uh, their beloved. That's where they would meet their beloved, like in Kashmir Ki Kali. Uh, <clears throat> when I see winter aesthetically in Indian cinema, uh, I am reminded of Sati Tre's uh, uh, under... under um, appreciated film Kanchan Janga and that's that's that was one of Satitre's original screenplay where he placed all his characters in a hill station in a win on a wintry day the dysfunctionality of the family comes open when the clouds are covering uh, the Kanchan Janga where the peaks cannot be seen but the dysfunctionality and the cracks of the family comes out in the open and when at the end of the day when the sun is about to set the clouds disperse and you get the sunlight falling onto the peak of Kanchanjanga and suddenly out of those cracks comes strength and the family, the disadvantage within the family finds strength and the feudal lord on top of the family, the all-powerful uh, man of the house or the lord of the family loses his position of power at the end of the day when the sunlight comes. So Satitre here used the weather, the coldness, the fog, the mist, the cloud and the snow peak and the, and the last sunlight of the day in order to communicate the various moods uh, and the various frailties that uh, that are uh, that inhabit an, a, a typical indian family and uh, his in his in his inevitable way he uses the psychological realism uh, a, 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 and kind of juxtaposes it with the with the weather the functionality of the weather the changing uh, weather and the musicality of, of of a hill station so that was one uh, very creative use of uh, winter weather in uh, <clears throat> Indian cinema. Otherwise, uh, winter has mostly been shown in, in a certain uh, irreverence, uh, as I said, wooing of the heroine, uh, romancing, or, 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 or even uh, where the hero, the heroine, as we use these terms in Indian cinema, uh, have to come together in intimacy. So winter represents intimacy, winter represents comfort, winter represents the, the, the finality of a relationship, etc., etc., etc. Uh, it, it, just the opposite. Uh, Shakespeare uh, compares love to gentle spring and lust to winter. And he disregards 
lust and winter and 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 places uh, gentle spring and 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 love uh, right on top of that so uh, you see this contrast between the western hemisphere and the eastern hemisphere <coughs> when i started doing theater my exposure to realism was through european realism before indian realism uh, strange that it may sound and it was through ibsen and chekhov two gentlemen two playwrights two geniuses who came from the coldest part of uh, western and the northern hemisphere who epitomized the the cold climate um, and uh, uh, chekhov suffered a lot uh, because of winter because of cold his health suffered a lot and he wrote a lot of uh, his um, plays while he was recuperating in slightly warmer climates uh, because he was suffering from winter so in his plays many a times you have characters who are uh, enclosed within a closed room or a house in front of the fireplace while they are debating and arguing about uh, um, the place of man in the emerging society same in ibsen in ibsen ibsen's characters are constantly debating arguing about the place of the woman or the protagonist or the antagonist in 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 in, in the given society so in, in so the western realism which was trying to find the place of man in the emerging new society that particular kind of realism actually emerged from uh, from from imagination which were uh, carved out in winter climate so in a way uh, winter played uh, i would say a pivotal role in 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 defining the early western realism the chekhovian realism the ibsenian realism as opposed to the indian realism which the tendulkar realism or the elkunchuar realism or the badal sarkar realism which is which is uh, completely uh, different and uh, they they don't they don't bring winter into uh, play at all <clears throat> in terms of cinema again uh, in western cinema we find that winter has been used brutally and not just western cinema i'm a big fan of chinese and japanese cinema and winter has been used to show brutality and cruelty in uh, films after film jiang yimou the chinese master his 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 most favorite motive is blood on the white snow pristine white snow covered with blood where operatic sword fights happen beautiful sword fights happen and from this opera and beauty suddenly you see terror because someone is slit you don't see the person's uh, person's throat being slit but you see droplets of blood falling on snow and the blood spreading on snow and that itself creates a certain kind of uh, uh, imagery of of poetry uh, maybe oriental poetry uh, but yet the blood on the snow is the motive which many chinese and japanese uh, filmmakers use in order to um, to 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 sort of you know provoke your imagination of of cold and warmth of human blood being spilled in a cold sort of a environ you know so this conflict of cold and warmth we see in the oriental films in the western hemisphere uh, snow and ice has been used most brutishly uh, i mean i don't have to uh, give a bigger example than the film which came out just about 4 years ago called the reverend directed by enaritu um based on a 2002 novel american novel about the the pioneers and the outbacks of the of of the wild west uh where a character is battling winter cold cold winter and creatures of winter cold winter and in all of that we see the savagery of man being nothing compared to the savagery of nature the cold nature so the the, the though the film is about the savagery of man against man but the savagery of nature overwhelms the savagery of man constantly in the film uh, revenant and that was uh, uh, quite an eye opener the way a man battles weather the man battles man but the weather uh, in a way uh, also protects man at the end of it if you really look at it because uh, with 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 the, with the within the battle of man versus man there is always a finality someone has to die someone has to perish but in terms of the weather and the man uh, the the lead character was constantly taking shelter within nature within nature and getting protected and moving forward so that was that was very interesting in revenant uh, but winter when used by an asian filmmaker winter is used in a totally different way he he takes away the brutishness and brings in harmony uh, uh, akira kurosawa mostly made films in japanese language the only film which he made 
outside Japanese language was a Russian film called Desra Zula. And that's based in Siberia. And Kurosawa actually looks at the landscape, the wintry landscape of Siberia and creates a character out of it. And he throws his two main characters within that, uh, the character of Siberia and lets them play around their emotions. So the two characters, one is a native hunter who survives with nature in, in tandem with nature and a Russian uh, explorer who is an urban person, who is so-called civilized person who looks down upon the wild, who looks down upon the old ways, which he considers savage ways. And then he needs this man, this hunter, this, this Razula to survive. And they form a bond. And slowly the explorer gets to realize that there is nothing bigger and greater than nature. And nature ha has a way of uh, creating character. So there we see the use of winter, the use of the wintry landscape, forming bonds between men. In Revenant, we saw men fighting men, men savaging men. Here we see men bonding with men uh, within the uh, landscape of nature. <coughs> uh, in terms of theater, there are lots and lots of plays. As I, as I mentioned, Ibsen and I, I mentioned Chekhov. Uh, Nabila spoke about Russian literature that also had has had a huge impact on me, including, including Pushkin and Gorky. One of the uh, most uh, important plays that I did was called Mother, which is based on uh, Gorky's uh, uh, novel. It was adapted by uh, Brecht, of course. And uh, that was a political play where, uh, again, winter is used. Winter is used. The, 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 the warm coat becomes a metaphor. Warm coat becomes a metaphor for comforting. We have seen that in Western cinema, warm coat is used as a metaphor for romance. Where the, where the lead character, the hero, the leading man often takes off his coat and puts it on the shoulder of a slightly shivering uh, the heroine or the leading woman. In a way, he's protecting her. In, 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 in these plays also, in Russian plays also, we see the warm coat is a, is a very import, important metaphor where it could be a soldier's warm coat, a soldier putting a warm coat on a dead body. It could be uh, a warm coat being put on a factory worker because his coat or her coat is completely torn. But the warm coat is a very, very important metaphor. We have had a wonderful Hindi film, which was an adaptation of Russian literature, Dostovsky's. It's called Garam Coat, which Balrat Sahani plays the lead character. So again, as I, uh, as I, uh, as I say that, uh, in our cinema also, in our theater also, we have had Winter playing a part. But the part that Winter played has been in sharp contrast to the Western or the Northern Hemisphere. So it's 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 more comforting, it's more secure, it's more romancing as opposed to the isolation, desolation, depression, and oppression of right. the Western Hemisphere. Uh, in cinema, you already mentioned Bergman, my my favorite filmmaker. I mean, all his films, more or less, are are uh, except Persona, perhaps. All his films are uh, based around a space landscape where characters are dealing with winter as much as they are dealing with each other's frosty emotions right till uh, Lars von Trier, where you see the characters again dealing with winter, again dealing with brutality within them, etc., etc., etc. So these two contrasts that we see in the Western and uh, Eastern Hemisphere, I think, um, also speaks about the aesthetic difference of looking at nature, looking at weather, looking at metaphor, looking at imagery, and how these imageries can uh, take totally different meanings. Uh, in in, in so when you when the when the culture or the geographical right. uh, space changes, uh, it's that's a very all very very, very, uh, very, very interesting anybody. perspective. In fact, uh, if I very interesting perspective. In fact, if I take uh, uh, particularly what you stated in the context of the Western and uh, our part of the world, yeah. and if I also consider the developmental paradigm. In fact, that uh, Nabila also put across. Uh, particularly relating global literature with uh, politics, with uh, development. I mean, Nabila, there's a question for you, uh, which also emerges from the deliberation that uh, was presented by Joy. Uh, see, in fact, when you talk about this development paradigm, we often relate the Occident and the Orient, not always the Occident and the Orient as such, but even from the perspective of uh, development, rather, the global North and the global South. This is the term that we often use. The global north is all that uh, we identify with development. <clears throat> global south is under development or develop, developing kind of a version. So uh, is it that uh, winter 
or the seasonal fluctuations, have they affected the ways, in fact, we are looking at development or going about development? Just as suppose, I, I give you an example. In this part of the world, in China and India, uh, the developmental forces have been so overbearing that our growth ambitions, or what I call often reductionist growth ambitions, have actually destroyed the environment. On the other hand, you find, in fact, in uh, Occidental Europe, especially in, uh, there is a movement called the degrowth movement that is happening, in fact, uh, with the Catalan school and other schools, uh, which essentially is talking about the fact that human prosperity lies in culture, ethos, music, literature, rather than in economic growth, which is destroying our environment. So there is a very critical disconnect in the ways we are looking at development between the global north and the global south. And if you look at the temperature levels, the ways we are looking at seasons, those are also different. So what do you think about this, being a development professional from your perspective? There is definitely a, um, a sort of cultural dissonance between the way that I think development is envisioned in, in the global north um, or also what we in shorthand call the west and the way that it's been seen in, in, in the east and the global south. Um, not easily explained away, I think, merely by ecology, although, of course, you know, that that is uh, absolutely one of the defining ways in which, uh, you know, societies carry out. So if there is a close relationship of a community with nature, um, you know, a close link with the land. And, um, you know, or, or and a society is mainly agricultural or, you know, a community depends on the forest. I think that relationship with what development then means, um, you, you would think intuitively, right? It would be more uh, oriented in the more natural uh, e ecological point of view. But and yet we see that that's a, a thinking that seems to come more after a certain level of industrialization wealth has been achieved and therefore you see more of it now um, in the occident um, and where you know countries that are warmer countries that are trying now to leap quickly towards that level of development that the west has reached are now putting um, you know ecology and environment to a side um, so yeah it is very interesting in that sense um, I think speaking from the politics of the of the literature and the articulation, um, another interesting thing that occurred to me um, also, uh, you know, when when Joy was talking, um, is you know the the fact that so there's a certain kind of winter um, literature that comes out of I would say uh, a certain north or the west that has had more access to uh, to both writing and to being in the public discourse and has had more wealth so you know we are more familiar with scandinavian literature we are more familiar with with american german um french russian um, British literature about winter uh, and yet you know and they're, they're describing it as a struggle and in the modern and they're describing it as a struggle from inside uh you know a, a very comforting environments and looking outside at it through this frost um we have also heard then of you know in the modern sense uh, there's a lot of writing that now become cult literature with millennials so for example if you talk about into the wild for example uh, a lot of this thinking among young writers that there is um, a certain struggle to be had in going into the unknown into the wild where the, where it is cold and that's how we prove that we are still you know able to live with the elements and to fight against the elements although our daily lives are not providing us that uh, you know the opportunity to to have those fights that that, that allow us to uh, see ourselves standing shoulder to shoulder with the ancestors that we think were cooler and braver. Um, but at the same time, there is a certain cold part of the world from which we don't hear a lot, and that's changing quickly. But so there is, a, you know, um, there is a correlation between well. So, for example, all of um, Central Asia, uh, I don't know if there's, you know, in our mainstream public canon of literature, there is that view of winter. Um, is not as present as, say, you know, the Russian uh, or the, or the, the American uh, view of winter, uh, you know, so you're you're seeing more writing, for example, even even in India, like, uh, you know, the colder parts of India, that, where is the, 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 there is a lot, as Joy said, in Bollywood, but where's the literature that's coming out? And does that have something to do with more of these inequities? And, and is this a good metaphor to look at those inequities is something that I find very fascinating. Well, this is, of course, a very fascinating hypothesis that uh, needs to be tested. Uh, I mean, there are, uh, you know, anecdotal evidences which we often keep on citing in public domain. 
But uh, let me again come to joy with this. Uh, rather, uh, I mean, very, very interesting examples and cases that you had been citing. In fact, the ways uh, uh, winter has been looked at in Indian movies. Uh, and, and, and definitely, this is something that, that there's a complete divergence between the two. Just as you spelled out, uh, Shami Kapoor movies and the winter is somehow identified as Yahoo, Chahe Kohi Mujhe Jangli Kahe. Whereas on the other side, you find uh, something like Seventh Seal or Schindler's List, or even supposedly the Chinese and the Japanese movies, where the hot blood is spilled on the ice, on the snow itself. So this kind of a macabre uh, visual that comes <clears throat> out from the Hollywood movies, and 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 uh, that is that also correlates things with winter. Uh, Definitely, this. Uh, whereas in most cases, when you let us look at our horror films, as far as our, our horror films are concerned, we talk of ghosts or the death. That is related to something that is dark or black, particularly yeah. the Ramsey brothers. I don't know, yeah. <laughs> Purana Mandir or something like that. If I recall some of those titles, yeah. out there it's uh, sometimes in white. So it's uh, definitely the season, the way in fact we perceive uh, the season itself. That gets reflected in our movies, in our dramas, in plays, and literature. So uh, this divergence, I presume, is pretty clear, as you rightly pointed out. Even even from the, but but uh, here also we have you know such a special dispersion when we talk about say you mentioned about the manators of Kumayun. Uh, out there, in fact, you find the tigers, you find the cold, and you find a hunter. Yeah. So. So there, in fact, when you find the cold, the cold is something that is related to some, uh, something pretty eerie and horrific. Okay. Uh, well, I largely, uh, of course, I agree with you. So if you would just like to add something more on that, because I stopped you in midway. <coughs> no, uh, what I what I was uh, alluding was that uh, in our uh, culture, the winter or cold is not looked at as a brute, as a brute. You know, it it doesn't represent fury. L like like in Shakespeare and plays, every imagery of of brutishness or fury or anger is 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 uh, is winter. You know, and, and and in Scandinavia or in the in the, in the Middle Europe also, everything to do with the coldness of heart is alluded to winter. But that doesn't happen over here so much. I gave the example of two or three um, the redeeming features of winter in Western cinema, Western culture, which is the use of the of the coat that represents both benevolence, where the well-to-do takes off his warm, uh, well-to-do coat and puts it on a poor man, where the leading man takes his jacket and puts it on the leading woman. <coughs> so they represent uh, some sort of, uh, uh, what should I say, uh, warmth, you know, the, 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 the sort of uh, sharing of the warmth, alluding to romance, and of course, representation of poverty. In Western cinema, poverty is often represented by the holes in the coat. You know, right. the, the 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 tattered jacket, the tattered coat, the hole in the coat represents, and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a man or a woman in a fur, in fur, in finery, in winter finery, often represent uh, of, of exclusivity or privilege. I, I don't know if we have seen privileges in in, 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 in summer imagery so much, as much as we see it in winter imagery, because the most distinct imagery of privilege is the fur, you know, which a woman wears, wears and, the, and, the, and, 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 and the man's uh, hat, the, the, the hat and the kind of coat and the jacket he wears represents his, his class in, in that sense, in the Western hemisphere. In India, we don't have those uh, imagery. Even though the early um, Hindi cinema tried to copy uh, the the old Hollywood, the 40s, 30s, 40s Hollywood, yes. <coughs> where the leading man was wearing a tie and a jacket and a hat. Mm -hmm. But he still did not represent the class because uh, in films like Avara, where Raj Kapoor represented the downtrodden, was also wearing a torn jacket, was also wearing a hat, also singing the song, Dera Juta Hai Japani, etc., etc. But he was a poor man. So these were actually yeah, reflections of... of Reflections of cinema from from the mm -hmm. West, because Raj Kapoor was so influenced uh, by Disika. Disika had not come to India at that time, but mm -hmm. Raj Kapoor had seen Disika's films and stuff like that. So he was influenced by the Umbar to the and the and the Bicycle Thief and stuff like that, right. and the early Russian films. And so the the 
imagery of the coat and the jacket and all of it downtrodden in indian cinema was there which actually if you move to the realistic part of indian cinema uh, it's totally dispensed of when you come to the space where pothir pachali uh, ushers in uh, that is totally dispensed of because it's all about the torn dhoti and the torn vest or or the bare bodied uh, rib uh, bearing uh, indian peasantry right from do biga zameen to uh, till this day the coat jacket uh, the winter images don't reflect uh, poverty uh, or class struggle in our society as much as it does in the west uh, yeah, interesting that is that there is a question out here that i have for you joy yeah. Uh, yeah. i recall uh, particularly uh, two uh, bengali movies one happens to be uh, one was made into a hindi movie jighangsha which was made into a hindi movie b salwad i presume might right. have seen at right. least yes, one yes, of the versions yeah, yeah, yeah. so if uh, if you recall in fact out in b salwad you find the uh, i mean the kind of a tears that they are wearing the overcoats and yeah. it has uh, that kind of a darkish wintry kind of a feeling yeah uh to a certain extent somebody told me that it's largely been influenced by the hound of baskervilles yeah uh, i don't recall correctly yes so uh, now on the other hand when this bengali movie was made either jighang shaw there was another one called kuheli right uh, bishu it was the hero yeah, yeah. so uh, out there also i find this kind of a western outfit and uh, the wintry setting and then you find a horror song at the yeah. background but as such why is it that even in bengali movies whereas the bengali culture we the bengalis or we mm. in fact in this part of the world particularly yeah. in the plains whether in chennai or uh, kolkata not so mm. much in mumbai you, in mumbai you don't have a winter to yeah. that extent but uh, we relate winter with uh, of course with fun frolic holidays picnic and all these things mm. so why is it that we have <laughs> always been influenced by this kind of an occidental clothing an occidental culture i think uh, the element of fog and mist oh. which winter brings in is also a representation of mystery it's a very exotic exoticized mysteriousness that a fog or the mist creates and that happens only in winter of course the imagery comes again from a foggy london or a or a oh. or a misty shire you know and we directly imported in our cinema in films like kohra we literally call the right. film kohra okay kohra. so from this foggy kohra this thing emerges these the, the quintessential horror um what should i say uh, leading lady sadhana you know she comes yes. through the mist and the fog in a white sari looking ethereal and she vanishes so the kohra and the mist actually uh, is always used and it's a, it's 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 a cliche it's a cliche which is borrowed from from Uh, 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 so Europe. this also has something to do with our colonial hangover i would say oh, at absolutely. least at that point in time absolutely 90% of our cinema uh, had has hmm. colonial hangover and will carry on having i mean uh, hmm. it will take many a filmmaker to create uh, many a pothir pachali to break the right. shackles of uh, colonial imagery of hmm. everything you know representation of man the emerging society etc etc Uh, i think there's a question from aryaman kakkar let's uh, address that and i presume that it's going to be uh it's uh, it, it's uh, addressed to it has to be addressed by joy to an extent looking at creators such as hawa mizaza <coughs> uh murakami and others like them and the theme man versus nature which interpretations and representations <coughs> winter of winter have stuck with you i think uh, nabila should answer this because nabila is, uh, was uh, nabila. was actually indulging in the metaphors and stuff like that related to winter so she should answer no, uh, well nabila you go first then we can also come to joy possibly. sure yeah i'll, I'll quickly hmm. jump into it and then and then uh, of course i defer to joy on this um you know one interesting thing thought that occurred to me when you were talking uh, you were having a conversation about how uh, metaphors have come to us from another culture and then they stick because they become a part of it and i was just making a connection with politics here so i feel like war being uh, you know a big genre of cinema and 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 also literature and and the way that it was conducted earlier made 
winter a part of the way that we looked at apocalypse so because i think during world war 2 and then you know the theaters of war during the cold war um etc to a certain extent this 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 thing that espionage was being conducted in the cold in europe and that wars were being fought in the trenches and then soldiers were struggling through the ice and snow i think translated into a lot of our apocalyptic visions being then couched in those winter terms so you would see apocalypse being shown as this misty dead sort of uh, you know um, bare bone trees and 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 a snowy winter a nuclear winter and also the nuclear um the, the whole story of the the context <clears throat> of the new weapons being for a long time we was part of that um and then now um i find find it very interesting this is another hypothesis really um now that the theaters of war for a lot of the western countries which are the kind of the defining force in a lot of the mainstream global literature and cinema both um have are have now become hot places um since vietnam to some extent but also now across the middle east uh you know we have a, a bigger lens on the crises that are happening in the middle east that we have a bigger lens on a bigger lens but also a lot of the western wars are being fought in the desert and in in hot places and so i've i've noticed it's interesting um that a lot of this apocalyptic um on screen uh, fictions that are being written whether it's tv shows that show uh, anarchy or you know the future of america or any other country which has become sort of been been hit by a virus or has been hit by some sort of a, 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 a an apocalyptic event and now people are struggling through it are now coming across more as hot places where people are oh. you know with the with the bandana on their heads and sort of trying to sweat through and struggle through with the sun shining hard on their faces so i think there is a way in politics then defines the way we do literature also you know very pertinent to the question uh, that that uh, arimen just asked about this man versus nature and how it keeps you know um switching between different time periods and different histories of literature so it's you know there there is a, obviously the way that miyazaki's uh, you know winter and murakami's oh. winter are a certain thing but then there's also you know the apocalyptic winter of those wars and now that that you know has shifted to the apocalyptic summer to some extent uh, which to me is very interesting joy if you want to jump into yeah. that question now yeah you know i was just so, thinking that we are talking about highbrow literature but the 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 piece of fiction imagination or creation which uh, impacted the popular culture in this decade uh, especially the young audience was uh, a book called uh, the song of fire and ice which was made into this series called game of thrones the where the most definitive byline was winter is coming yes and <laughs> so because you know when i when i when i talk to youngsters and all many times i have to give references of popular culture for them to um, correlate and grasp what i'm trying to say and all the time game of thrones comes up and the line winter is coming comes up where winter is coming represents by and large decimation oh. end of the world end of life now you can call it global warming or you can call it world war x or whatever but that is the defining uh, imagery which comes to me and uh, those creatures that are portrayed in game of thrones for me that's the that's the backlash of nature for me that's the backlash of nature which which is represented within the popular culture spectrum and i find that very very interesting um even though it's a popular culture because it it captures the popular sentiment and popular imagination i i thought it was it was quite interesting quite brilliant especially the byline um winter is coming mm -hmm. okay so we have we are almost past time it's almost for the last 60 minutes that we have been talking about winter in this <coughs> wintry evening uh in kolkata and i presume that it's quite pleasant as far as you are concerned joy in mumbai because oh, you were the only person the out here it was a hot day today i went to the farmers protest uh, farmers uh, uh, ekta <laughs> march today in azad yeah. maidan and while mm -hmm. they are sitting in the singhu border freezing their asses right here in azad maidan it was so hot everybody were trying to get under a tree or under a shed or something like that it's it's, I, it's funny the the dichotomy could never funny I could make that out because Dabila and I are the only ones, in fact, wearing an some kind of a sweater or a pullover, <laughs> uh, and you are the one only with a shirt. So yeah. uh, th now this is the problem of Mumbai. Actually, you only have two seasons: a monsoon and a non-monsoon. Yeah, so, <laughs> and also the weather spectrum is very funny 
like in the day time when the sun is out is very hot but mm. uh, come evening and late evening when the sea breeze blows and yes. then uh, night if you are in your uh, singlets and all suddenly you might catch a cold mm. so it's I, a very deceptive uh, weather yeah yeah uh, I, in, I also happen to be a mumbai i i stayed there for a right. decade actually right, right. to kolkata right, right. right. Anyway, so uh, it's been a very, very engaging dis discussion. Rather, I would say that I am not really a literator. Uh, I have been only been learning from you two so far. Uh, somehow we missed out on Dr. Tom Lutz, who couldn't join from US primarily because of uh, time zone differences. I presume that it's going to be yeah. pretty early in the morning for yeah. him. And maybe he got stuck up with uh, something and couldn't get his hot cup of coffee at, on time. <laughs> so anyway. So uh, thank you very much to both thank you. Joy and Nabila. It's been fascinating, thank absolutely you. fascinating. The both pleasure, of you, pleasure, both of you were pleasure. great. To so listen to Nabila so, and you. Oh, uh, I, I'm only the only the uh, person who is a student out here because uh, <laughs> I understand very little about literature. I only understand about complex equations and some bits of econometric modeling. That's why. <laughs> that's what I have been doing for my life. <laughs> So to thank you. Thanks a lot. And I presume with uh, this is the penultimate discussion that we had in this particular festival. So yeah. I hope that it's been a fabulous arrangement on part of the organizers. So thanks to Coral and the entire team. Uh, so you have a nice weekend, all of you, all the listeners, all the panelists, Coral organizers. Thank you. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.